In physics, we constantly measure things. When something is accelerating, for example, that is when something is changing its speed, a force must be causing this acceleration. We know this because Newton's first law of motion, which is also known as the law of inertia, says that a mass at rest tends to remain at rest, and a mass moving at a constant velocity tends to keep moving at that velocity unless it is acted upon by an outside force. So that means both when an object is not moving or is not changing its speed, its acceleration is zero. And from Newton's most famed equation, force equals to mass times the object's acceleration, we can see that if there is no acceleration, that means there is no force. And if you do have an acceleration, that means a force is causing that change in motion. This is all theory, but how do we actually measure all of these variables in real life, in moving objects? Where would we start? In order for us to do this, we need to measure from a specific reference point. Let us imagine that you are standing still on the road, waiting for the traffic light to go green so that you can cross the road. And as you are waiting, you see a car move 10 meters in about 5 seconds. Relative to you, you can conclude that the speed of this car is 2 meters per second, and it is moving away from you 2 meters every second. But what about the person in the car? The person in the car doesn't view themselves moving, but rather everything around him is moving back. So if they look at you standing outside, they can say you are moving 2 meters every second away from him. Now, this may sound a bit counterintuitive, but in physics, both these answers are correct, both the drivers and yours. And that is why we have a special term for this difference in relativity. It's called frame of reference. In physics, you have to be very clear in what frame of reference you're making your conclusions in. Is it the driver's frame of reference? Or is it the reference of a man standing still by the road? Now let's consider another example. Imagine that you are still standing by the road and you see a bus passing you by. And like the car that just passed you, it's traveling at a constant speed. So because it is traveling at a constant speed, that means that the overall force acting on the bus is zero. Well, this is because the engine is providing a force forward to make the car move forward. And the road is exerting friction on the bus, opposing its motion. So these two are equal. So the two forces cancel out and the overall force is zero. Inside the bus, though, we see a blue ball that is on the floor. So from my frame of reference, I can see that the ball is moving at the same speed the bus is. But to any other person aboard the bus, they would say no, the ball is not moving at all. It's at rest. And like before in the car, everything outside is moving away from the ball and from the people in the bus. Now what happens though is the traffic light goes red and the bus is breaking to a complete stop. What will happen to the ball as the bus is coming to a complete stop? Well, from the frame of reference from the bus, the ball rushes forward towards the front of the bus and it appears to have a force because it had a change in speed, right? Because it just went from rest to now moving. So there was an acceleration. And from Newton's law, we know that there was a force. But where did this force come from? It can't just appear from nowhere. It just doesn't make any sense. What about you standing outside? What did you see in that instant? Well, what you probably saw was the bus slowing down from its constant speed. And as it was slowing down, you saw the ball rushing to the front of the bus with the same speed the bus had before until it stopped upon hitting the front of the bus. So the conclusion of the observer outside is that from Newton's first law, since the ball was still in motion, it stayed in motion until opposed by a force which was when it collided with the inside of the bus. Whose conclusion is right though? Well, the conclusion made by the person in the bus is wrong because forces require energy. 
And even though there seemed to be a force acting on the ball at that instant, energy does not just appear out of anywhere. But the conclusion made by you, outside observing this, supports both the observations for the two frames of references, as this conclusion takes into account the fact that the bus was originally in motion and it would stay in that motion unless acted upon by another force. This here was the example of the two main types of reference frames. For you outside observing all this at rest, your acceleration is zero because there is no overall force acting on you. So this reference frame is what we call an inertial frame of reference. This is a reference frame in which whatever you are measuring or observing, you are either not moving at all or moving at a constant speed. So either way, there is no overall force acting on you. But for the person in the bus observing all this, when the bus started changing its speed, it had acceleration due to a force. So this means that this reference frame was neither at rest or at constancy. So this reference frame is what we call a non-inertial frame of reference. Non-inertial frames of reference, just like the one above, can lead you to think that there are forces acting on an object that don't even exist. These forces, just like the supposed force that was acting on the ball, are called fictitious forces. And fictitious forces are forces that appear to be there by observing things in the non-inertial frame of reference. Another example of a fictitious force would be this. Take it that you are in a car and you're trying to take a sharp turn around a roundabout. If there was someone from an inertial frame of reference observing this from the outside, they would say that this car is moving around in a circle. So he or she has a force pointing towards the center of the roundabout. This force is called the centripetal force. And what this centripetal force does is since an object will maintain the same direction and speed if there is no force acting upon it, the centripetal force pointing towards the center of the roundabout constantly changes the car's velocity. So it's changing its direction so it can keep moving in that circular motion. What about the non-inertial frame of reference? So this is from the person in the car. Most of you watching this probably know that when you're in a car, whenever you make a turn to the left, you feel a force pushing you to the right. And whenever you make a turn to the right, you feel a force pushing you to the left. For the person in the car, there is always a force that is opposing the centripetal force the force that keeps you in that circular motion. This is also a fictitious force because it is only present in the non-inertial frame of reference. And in the inertial frame of reference, you wouldn't think of imagining it. But in the non-inertial frame of reference, it is more real than the car itself. This also happens in those twirling amusement park rides that spin people at immense speeds. In the inertial frame of reference, they only see the centripetal force changing its direction. But the non-inertial people in these rides experience a really strong force pushing them against their backs. This strong force that's pushing them against their backs is another fictitious force that is known as the centrifugal force. So, so far, we have three of these fictitious forces and no reason to support its existence. For all we know, these forces shouldn't even exist. So why do they? Look at this. If we look at every single example that involves a non-inertial frame of reference, that is in our case, the ball in the bus, the person in the car, and the twisting carnival ride, there is all one link between all of these scenarios, and it is that there is a presence of acceleration, and hence, meaning there is a presence of a force. And as we said, the presence of a force changes the speed or the direction of the object, its velocity essentially. So what is happening here is that all the observers, in this case being the humans and the ball on the bus, they all have inertia, which is just another way of saying mass. 
everything that exists has inertia or has mass. And what this basically means is that everything has a natural resistance to any force applied to it. Meaning that if you have two objects, one with higher mass than the other, if you apply the same force to both of them, the object with the least mass will move more than the heavier object. And this is because an object that has more inertia is more resistant to a change in motion. And all objects, if at rest or at a constant motion, will maintain that tendency unless a force disrupts this constancy. And this is exactly why we get these fictitious forces. The ball in the bus only stopped moving when it hit the front of the bus. And this is because it had a constant speed. And it will keep moving at that constant speed until a force acts to change that motion. The person in the car and also the person in the twisting carnival ride feel as if they are pushed outwards when they are moving in that circular motion because they have mass. They are resisting the change in motion. So this resistance is felt as if the person is pushed backwards and it is misconceptionally analyzed as a force. This means that it's not a force at all, but rather it's a fundamental property of matter. And by us analyzing the non-inertial frame of reference, we can see what having mass actually means. It means resisting the changes in motion that are caused by the forces of nature. Now with all this knowledge under our belt, we finally know what Isaac Newton meant when he said that a mass at rest tends to remain at rest and a mass moving at a constant velocity tends to keep moving at that velocity unless acted upon by an outside force. And with this, not only have we further understood Newton's laws, but this further solidifies its existence in our universe. Thank you for listening, and that's all the physics I have for you today.